This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, y'all can look up here and see the pastor's not here. <laughs> <laughs> so, he asked me uh, to fill in for him. So, we're going to do things a little bit different. He had already printed up the bulletins, and I'd already read the lectionary. So, when I decided what I was going to do with the uh, topic with uh, homily, I'd already read one verse, and actually for New Year's Day, there's three choices from the lectionary. And he chose a different one that's written in here. He chose the one about the, uh, the talents, the three with the talents. I actually chose Matthew uh, chapter two, the massacre of the innocents. I'm kind of a dark person. So that's kind of what I chose to look at and talk about. So when we get to the homily, uh, we are going to, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, and then Debbie and Christy are going to do some special music for us. Is anyone in here familiar with the lively little song called the Coventry Terror? Okay, probably one of the most depressing <laughs> Christmas carols. There he is. But it's, uh, it's not the, uh, the most... Uh, it's not as bad as the 12 days of Christmas, but it's pretty close. Okay. Now, on the 12 days of Christmas, and this is the 12 days, you know, they start on Christmas, we're on the sixth day of the 12 days of Christmas. And so they start on Christmas Day or the day right after Christmas. Christmas is its own day. They start on the 26th, and they go to the Epiphany, which is we'll celebrate next week. But, so we will uh, move ahead. So let's all rise up for a call to worship. Give thanks for God's guidance to our forebearers who plan and sacrifice to bring us to this hour. Let the nations be glad to sing for joy. Let all the people praise you, O God. Celebrate the name of Jesus, our sovereign, who calls us to holiness and obedience. <laughs> Let all of your namesakes rejoice in their salvation. Let all the people praise you, O Christ. Let us bear open prayer. O God, searcher of all our hearts, you have formed us as a people and claimed us for your own. As we come to acknowledge your sovereignty and grace and to enter anew into heaven. Let your spirit impress your truth on our inmost being and receive us in mercy for the sake of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is on page 117, O oh God, our heart in ages past. And, and also, if you haven't already done so, please turn your phones to uh, airplane mode.
Please be seated. Let's have our call to worship. Our call to worship. We've already done that. Our call to confession. How often we have turned away from the awkward places to which God calls us. How easily we forget the one whose name identifies us. Let us come to the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. God of love and heal us and busy city streets. We confess that we have not looked for you in the common place. Our doubts keep us from hearing the angels. And our fears keep us from leaving our security to meet you at the manger. We do not glorify and praise you, nor do we share the good news with our friends. For we have not yet allowed the message to claim us. Forgive us, God, and make your story of our own. Take a moment for your personal confession. God is at work in us, even now, bringing good news to the world through us. Amen. Amen. Do we have any joys or concerns? I have some concerns. Uh, my family is uh, pretty ill. Uh, my dad, <laughs> my dad's in the hospital. Actually, he's in rehab now. With my stepmom. Uh, my sister and my brother-in-law all have COVID and they're really struggling, so we'll keep them in their prayers. Lord have mercy. The, uh, the COVID has been going around pretty rampant. My mother and father had it, got cleared out of quarantine in the rehab center in San Saba. And they still have the alert out there that there is a they're a hot spot in San Saba County and that they have an outbreak at the facility. We keep everyone in their community prayers. It's a, it's a tough deal. Um, I have a couple of things. One, uh, Brandy's niece that we've all been praying for, they did find out what is wrong. Now it is how to treat it. But there is an artery or a blood vessel that is wrapped around her esophagus. And as she grows, it gets tighter. So they're trying to, trying to figure out which it is because it's also you know coming from the from the heart so it's just it's it, it's very very rare they are taught about it in school but they hardly ever see it um, and then also uh, this one's on me I made my first mistake of the year so I think I'm done for the year <laughs> but on the newsletter I forgot to change it, it still says December newsletter it is the January one everything else is correct in there but so I'm done for the year on the states. Yeah, well, maybe that'll be the worst thing. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You're and we're glad to have a good portion of the family here this year. Yeah. And Amy, all the way from the right, big commitment. <laughs> and from the top of the world, yeah. Patty lives closer to uh, oh, the Pole than to the <laughs> Glad everyone's here. On the upside, I called Vicki the other day and I didn't know they were gone and she answered the phone, but we just got off the plane in Denver. I'm improving and I was real proud to know that she thought she was improving enough to make the trip and they were on the way to Buffalo, Wyoming to get right. So uh, she's doing better. Good deal. Praise God. Lord have mercy. Here's yeah, our prayers. We're glad to see that Gail came out from that passage to stay, spend a little time with us all. Well, time. thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> anyway, I heard that Charlie and Travis fell and broke her arm. And, oh. and so the last I heard, she was in the temple. So, yeah, all I know. Lord have mercy. Yeah, have mercy. Charlene. Happy birthday to
Oh, we do. Barbara and Kurt, year seven. Yeah, we got married here seven years ago, right after church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, Barbara Kurt. Josiah's Reformation. Then the king directed that all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. All the people joined in the covenant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And our psalm is Psalm 50 on page 783. And we'll use a different response for the one in the book, and the words are the last two lines of the psalm. To those who order their way aright, I will show the salvation of God. It goes like this. To those who order their way aright, I will show the salvation of God. And the Bible. To those who order their way aright, I will show the salvation of God. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silent, before whom is a devouring fire, round about whom is a mighty storm. God calls to the heavens above and to the earth that the people may be judged. Faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. 
Let heavens declare God's righteousness, for God is the one who deserves. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. But I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. Do those who order their way to the right, but will show the salvation of God. But I will not accept a bull from your house, nor a he goat from your foes. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on the house and the hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all the moons in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine.
preparation for the gospel, you please be seated. Let's turn to page 641. Go up. about to search for the child to destroy him. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or a hundred, according to the time, he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what he had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, went to the land of Israel. When he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what he had spoken, so what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he would be called a Nazarene. Now Matthew has been talking about this in Sunday school. He had a specific task when he started writing the gospel. He is writing it to the Jewish Christians. He's writing to the Jewish people. He wants them to make sure that they know that Jesus is the Messiah. He's wanting to stress this. So 16 times he says, as is prophesied, he refers back to the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament. And that is three times more than in all the other Gospels combined. He really makes a point, and he really stresses it right here at the beginning here of the birth story. Now, his birth story is a genealogy, and then the wise men come. When we want a good birth story and a great story, we go to Luke. We read Luke. He is actually, Matthew's pretty short in his birth story. Jesus they say his genealogy, he ties him back to David and the way he's supposed to be as prophesied. And then the wise men, baby's born, wise men come. Okay? Now, in our liturgy, this is a little bit different too. Next week is Epiphany. Epiphany is when the wise men come. So next week, we're going to actually go back and read chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So the liturgy kind of jumps around because here we're talking about the wise men have already been there and have visited. Now, they're in Bethlehem and they're in a house. So we're going to see that next week. So they're still in Bethlehem and there's a period of time for the wise men. A lot of people talk about a couple of years. <coughs> they could have been there. So they went to the census. They left their home and went to Bethlehem. So they're staying there for a while. There's a lot of things to happen. This story, this story comes out of Matthew. This is the only place that this is documented, is this gospel, is, is in this gospel. And this is known as the Massacre of the Innocents. And it is recorded and celebrated within the church on December the 28th. It 
the Catholic Church and the Eastern Church, that's when they have the Feast of the Innocents. And that is when they celebrate these children because they are seen as the first martyrs for Christ. They died so Christ could live. And a lot of people say, well, why didn't they go warn the other kids so they could all be protected? Well, what would have happened if soldiers would have got there and there were no children? And they would have broadened out their search. Okay? Now, throughout our history of our, of our world and of religion, in the 1300s and earlier in England, they had a, they would do plays. They would act out parts of the Bible. One of the places they did this was in Coventry, England. Started this about 1392, from what I read, and then it got pushed down. And they stopped doing this in about 1584, somewhere along in those that range in time. So what's important is they were doing this, and the way they would do, they would act out parts of the Bible. They would act out Adam and Eve being thrown out of the garden, and the community would get together and act out these plays. And what they would do is the parts that they didn't like or they were that showed fear, they would actually mock those parts of the Bible. And that mocking of the Bible is what got caused it to be suppressed and they weren't able to do this. But some of these plays still live on. The most common one that you've all probably heard of, has anyone heard of the Passion Play? Mm -hmm. They do the crucifixion. I think they, do they still do the big one up that they do every year in Glen Road that they used to do out there. But anyway, there's several in this country that they go around and do a big Passion Play. And that came from this, uh, this history. And they call them mystery plays. So the play for this, I want y'all to think we're going to have uh, singers come up and sing this this song, a Coventry Carol. And it's a beautiful song, kind of sad, but very pretty. <coughs> but uh, I want you to think what they would do is they would have three women come out and sing this song, and they would bring their children out <clears throat> because this song is for the the children. And there are several different variations song being sung. So we're going to have this, our special music right now. This is the Coventry Carol. It's a little bit older than the hymns we sang today from like the 1700s. This is, it's a good song. Blue Joseph, so he tells Mary, I just had a dream, we need to 
get back on the donkey and head out where we're going to eat. Mary probably said, go on back to sleep. <laughs> That's too spicy of a meal here. So we're going to, uh, we don't want to do this. Well, what they do is they follow God. They get up, follow the advice. They get up and leave in the night. Now, a lot of the commentary that I read said this was the important when the wise men came. Everybody talked about how impractical the gifts were. Y'all remember what they were? Go with frankincense and myrrh. So if you had to get up in the middle of the night back in these days and you're going to be going it's about 150 miles to Egypt and we're not thinking that, that doesn't sound all that far does it? Well if you're taking a donkey <laughs> out in the middle of the night you might think it's a little bit more of a voyage. So they needed funds to go ahead and make this trip. What they had was had some gold, had some frankincense, and had some martin. Those were very valuable things. And then they went to Egypt. They got up. We don't know anything much about their trip. But you know, it had to be a pretty difficult journey. Back in those days, traveling the road, there was robbers, there was thieves out on the road. It's probably dangerous. We don't know how many people went. Did they have some extended family that went with them? Or was it just the three? We don't know. We don't get that information from Matthew's version because what Matthew's point is in telling this is that they go to Egypt. And that is to fulfill, fulfill the prophecy that out of Egypt I've called my son. And that's in Hosea, the prophet Hosea. It's talking about whenever the Hebrews were called out of Egypt when they were led out by Moses. This is what he's talking about. Now, when they realize they've been tricked, now in the later part of this, when he says that they're going to kill the children, when Herod saw that they've been tricked by the wise men, he had curated and sent and killed all the children in and of Bethlehem, who were two years old and under. This is a pretty interesting topic. Bethlehem, there's been a lot of debate over how many kids were killed. Originally, from the books in the mid uh, uh, fifth century and things, some people, well, some churches like the Coptic Church would say that there was 144,000 children. But then other churches say that's way too many. And some other, because Bethlehem, there's a song that documents this. Bethlehem is not a big town. When we sing the Christmas carol, it's oh, little, little, little town, town of Bethlehem. But in a little town, you're not going to expect to have 144,000 children under two years of age. That would be a big town. So then some say at 64,000. And then some people say at 14,000. So that's still a pretty good many. Well, in 1906, in the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, they said that the size of, because Bethlehem is about 25,000 people right now. And they said at that day and time, it's probably 700 to 1,000 people, possibly that in the area. So they said possibly six. On the low side to 20 on the high side. Children is what that said. Massive. And so, and when you look up, if you have a chance, go look up on the internet, Google the Coventry Carol, and there's a rendition of it, not near as good as what we heard this morning by a lady y'all met part of named Joan Baez. And what's interesting with Joan Baez is that they show the heart through the history of the, the people painting the pictures of the mothers protecting their their children in the circumstances and it showed those pictures as she sang that Coventry Carol so it's pretty pretty interesting but our next prophecy that we're fulfilling here is from the prophet Jeremiah then was fulfilled and was been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah a voice was heard in Ramah wailing and loud lamentation Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they were no more. Now, Jeremiah said this during the exile. They had been beat, they had been beat down, they were being taken captive. Ramah is where Rachel was buried. So she is buried, and as they're marching them, 
to have all the people tied together. We talk about the reins in their noses and tied them together and they're driving them and they're making this long walk. They go by Rachel's grave. And Jeremiah said that he heard Rachel weeping for the children of Israel that were going off in captivity to the Babylon. That has been destroyed. So here she is, what Matthew is saying, when the children got massacred for Christ, that Rachel wept again for the children. Now, this is a pretty depressing little topic we're talking about, isn't it? It's pretty sad. But how often does this go on? Right now, anybody watching football games yesterday? How many commercials did you see where they were talking about the immigrants in this world coming, traveling? They're running poor, fear for their lives, trying to protect their families. It's not just happening now. Several years ago, we talked about a lot in Sunday school, Syria. They were having a civil war. Refugees were crossing country borders, trying to find safety for their family and for their children. This has been going on since the beginning of time, and it's still going on to this day. Innocents are being slaughtered for greed of people in power. It's happening today. It's going to be happening tomorrow. And that's a terrible tragedy that goes on. But the point here is, this story, what have we been taught through Christ's teachings of how we're supposed to conduct ourselves? When we see people, Pastor Celia always told us when she was here, at the end of every service, she would say, love everyone you meet. Help them out because you don't know who you are meeting and who you're greeting. Is there danger in this? Should we have fear? Yes. Continuously, continuously, through the teachings of Jesus Christ, <coughs> that we are supposed to show compassion and help people. When Mary and Joseph started out on this trip, they probably needed a little compassion along the way. We don't know how they stayed, but it took a couple, three days to travel that 150 mile one about to with a little baby. Mm -hmm. Father needed some compassion along the way. And this is happening daily and it's happening in our community. So what we need to do with this is to love everyone we meet. Now, the last thing is it says he is going to be called a Nazarene or the Lord of Nazareth. Nazareth was kind of a do-nothing town. Later on we hear nothing good is ever Nazareth was an important community because of its location. It was on the main travel roads to the ocean, so there'd be a lot of travel went through Nazareth. It wasn't a big town, but a lot of travel, a lot of things went through. So life in Nazareth, you'd be exposed to a lot of stuff. Now what's strange about this is the very last sentence it says, so that spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene, that's nowhere in the Old Testament teachings. Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. Now, what they do talk about is a Nazarite. A Nazarite is someone like uh, Samson that took a vow, didn't uh, cut their hair, and lived, lived a certain lifestyle. That was a Nazarite. This is a totally different thing. A Nazarene is a person that came from Nazareth. Now, where this prophecy came from, they cannot, they do not know. It's not documented in the Old Testament, but we also know even from the Coventry Carol that we just sang today, that they got pushed aside and a lot of the stuff got destroyed, so they don't, they have some songs from it, and they have some information, but they don't actually have a good version of the entire play. And so, could this be some teaching a prophet that said something that we did not that did not get documented in the Bible. We don't. I don't know. We don't know. But they cannot find anywhere where that prophecy comes out. But Jesus, from the end of this gospel, he went and he became a Nazarene. Okay, but we don't know where that came from. 
So, we can learn out of this lesson, even though it is depressing me. Love who you meet. You don't, you don't know who's traveling. You don't know who, who needs your aid. This goes back to the, we've done several times at Christmas, what is the story that Grandpa Jones talks about, Santa Claus, his daddy does. Christmas guest. About being home. What's that? The Christmas guest. The Christmas guest. What he did was he was asking for Jesus to come see him and pray. A little kid showed up, gave him some help, kept him. Three people come by and in that night and pray, Jesus, why didn't you come see him? He said, oh, I did. I'm there three times. You're a great host. Okay? So that's what we learned here. Be a great host. Amen. 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 Now, we're going to do something a little bit different here. This is also our Coventry Sunday, as you got from Second Kings. And so for our... Uh, we're going to do Wesley's Coventry Prayer instead of a uh, the Apostles' Creed today. So yo, would y'all please stand and turn to page 609? 607. 607, yep, Coventry Prayer and the Wesleyan Tradition. <clears throat> Let us pray. I, I no longer, longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, bring me with whom thou wilt. Put me to duty, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or raised by thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low by thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified. Folks, to help the offering come forward. Let's pray. Dear God, everything we have comes from you. If we return our gifts to you to help with our church, Lead in your work. Let us use our gifts wisely that you share with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>